Acts chapter 28, verses 17 through the end of the chapter. We want to bring two messages from this portion of Scripture. Today is the first one, Lord willing, next week again. And we pick it up at verse 17, where Luke writes, After three days he, uh, the Apostle Paul, now in Rome, of course, he called together the local leaders of the Jews. And when they had gathered, he said to them, Brothers, Though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. And when they had examined me, they wished to set me at liberty, because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. But because the Jews objected, and those are the Jews down back in Jerusalem, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, though I had no charge to bring against my nation. For this reason, therefore, I have asked to see you and speak with you, since it is because of the hope of Israel that I am wearing this chain. And they said to him, We had received no letters from Judea about you, and none of the brothers coming here has reported or spoken any evil about you. But we desire to hear from you what your views are. For with regard to this sect, we know that everywhere... It is spoken against. And when they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in greater numbers. From morning till evening. Did you get that, church? No complaining. Come noon. From morning till evening. <laughs> he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. And it's important that we remember that the word kingdom, Greek word basilia, from where we get you know, St. Peter's basilica, uh, the word kingdom is only found in Acts seven times. Three at the very beginning, two more in the center, and then two at the end. In fact, it can, it's very clear Luke is intentional about using the word kingdom as a synonym for the gospel of Jesus Christ at the very beginning of Acts and at the end. And I'll show you something about that, but we need to keep in mind that we're being focused here. I mean, Luke is one can say, he's moving our heads. Look at this word. I'm about to finish a very, very, very long sequel to my gospel, and I want to end the way I finished. I want you to pay attention to the kingdom. So testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. And some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. And disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement which we will not focus on today, but Lord willing, next Sunday. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, go to this people and say, you will, never, you will indeed hear but never understand, and you will indeed see but never perceive, for this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn and I would heal them. Which is a quotation from Isaiah 6. Therefore, now Paul is actually finishing what he said as what Luke describes as when he said this, they just took off, they left. Paul wraps it up by after the quote by saying, therefore let it be known to you that this salvation of God and there we have it again, another word for kingdom of God, another way of saying the gospel of Jesus Christ, this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles, they will listen. And then Luke finishes. He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without Hindrance. Either you proclaim with your life that the kingdom of God is the best news, 
or you proclaim with your life that some other kingdom is the best way to live. But know this, everyone on the planet proclaims a kingdom. Everyone does. I want to illustrate with uh, something that maybe we're all familiar with, whether we participated in it or not. Um, some of us in here, being uh, a, a guy, a male, some of us in here had a club when we were 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 years old, and we just called it the boys club. I was part of that. And in the woods where I grew up, we built a fort. And with spray paint, we put a big sign on that fort. Guess what it said? No girls allowed. Keep out. Shh, keep out. No girls allowed. And just like on the Andy, Andy Griffith shows, the keeper of the light, keeper of the flame. We had rules, and uh, like little Opie, and we had rank. Uh, we had the way you became a member, initiation. We had to do something stupid, something dangerous, something risky, and um, like eat a worm or whatever. Um, we had all that. And we built fires in there, and we shot rabbits, and we skinned them and cooked them right over the flame. And we did all that. And then, all of a sudden, me and some of the older boys didn't like the younger boys. They were too childish. So we moved our fort 20 feet up into an oak tree because there ain't no way in the world these boys can get up here, and we, made it comp we just selected a big tree that you had at least to be I know you're going to laugh at this, but you had to be really tall <laughs> to grab the next branch. And we would look down at the little boys on the ground and make fun of them because they couldn't get up in our fort. What I just described to you was a kingdom. A man-made one, but it's a man-made kingdom with rank, with a way that you can get in, with rules, with a way of life, and there it was. Everyone in the world lives in a kingdom. Either God is on the throne or and you fill in the blank. And the whole world does this. Someone's in charge. Someone's living by someone's rules. Someone has made a way to get in. Someone has actually put a lock on the door, keeping others out. It's all there. A kingdom. The word kingdom in the Bible means domain. It means to rule and, and reign, either for good or for evil. And the language of kingdom sounds like this. My rules, my rights, my domain, my circle of friends, my value system, my way of salvation, my way of understanding the world we live in regarding all subjects, education, politics, sports, even ethical issues of sex, money, and power, Finally, my body, my life. That's kingdom language. That's kingdom language because there's a heart that is constantly working on the success of your kingdom, your domain, your life. But without Christ and his rule and reign, the sign that is posted outside the door of every heart, the sign that is posted outside the door of every heart reads like this. My club, restricted area, private property, God keep out, no Jesus allowed. And I see that every week. I see it in the face of people all the time when I'm witnessing to people, whether it be at Wayside or my neighbor or my family or wherever, I am watching people build their kingdom. Keeping God out. No Savior like Jesus allowed. 
everyone's doing it. Everyone belongs to a kingdom, the one you're building or the one that Jesus is building. And that's it. In other words, I just described to you the salvation of God. I just described to you the gospel. I just wrapped up the whole Old Testament in five minutes. That's what Paul was doing. He was explaining the kingdom of God to Jews who were only looking for a political tribal, a political tribal way of doing life as a kingdom, get Rome out of Jerusalem, establish the kingdom, but Jesus didn't come off like that, and so they're dismissing him. Jesus, stay out. We'll build our own kingdom without the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's three important questions as we, that we need to answer as we come and wrap to the, come to the end of the book of Acts and wrap this up. And God willing, say a little bit more about it next week. And we've done this before, but I think it's important that we just rehearse and remind our minds, <coughs> what have we been listening to the entire book of Acts can actually be summarized with these three questions. Since the very beginning, chapter 1, verse 1, and we're going to go back there in just a moment, not to start all over, but to remind ourselves of something important. So let's just remind ourselves. Number one, what is the kingdom of God? What is it? What is the kingdom of God? And if there were a passage in all of Scripture that I would use to answer this, it comes from Luke's penmanship, but not in the book of Acts. Remember, this is a sequel to his gospel. It's found in Luke chapter 17, verse 20. If you'd like to follow me there. How do you answer what is the kingdom of God? Let's hear from Jesus himself. Luke 17, verse 20, Jesus is standing in front of the Pharisees. And Luke 17, 20, being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, began, because they are looking for this physical establishment only, he answered them, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. Jesus was hinting that the kingdom of God is standing right in front of you and you don't see it. I'm the king and I come with a rule and domain. I come with initiation right and how you must enter and who can be in and who has to stay out. I'm it. And he's standing right in front of them, and they don't see the kingdom of God. Jesus goes on to elaborate on that point in chapter 18, verse 15. Now they were bringing even infants to him that he might touch them, and when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them to him, saying, Let the children come to me, and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. In other words, did you see it? Let the children come to me, for such belongs, because they belong to the kingdom of God, which is the same thing as saying they belong to me. Jesus is the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And the ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? Jesus is not denying his own good character. He's just simply lowering himself to appeal to this man's blindness. No one is good except God alone because this guy does not see Jesus as God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, all these I have kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And come follow, follow what? Me. Now watch what Jesus does with this. But when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. And Jesus, looking at him with sadness, said, how difficult it is for those who have wealth to what? Read the text. Enter the kingdom of heaven. In other words, he can't follow Jesus and he can't enter the kingdom of God because he has a, the wrong understanding of a kingdom. This wealthy man has been building his own kingdom and he's rejecting Jesus. 
He's rejecting the true kingdom of God and therefore can't enter it. Those who heard it said, then who can be saved? Again, salvation. Salvation is of the Lord. Salvation is, is the gospel in Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the kingdom of God. It is the domain and rule and reign of God. It's all one. Don't you see? But Jesus said, what is impossible with men is possible with God. And Peter said, see, we have left our homes and followed you. Which means we have not built our own kingdom. We have homes, we have money, but that's not where our kingdom is. And he said to them, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God. Notice what Peter said. We have left our homes and followed what? Verse 28, you. And then Jesus says, Again, for the sake of the kingdom of God. What is Jesus doing? He is constantly weaving himself with these personal pronouns with the phrase kingdom of God. It's one and the same. Who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. So what is the kingdom of God? It is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the kingdom of God. And as we see, down in verse 28, Acts 28, back in Acts 28, verse 20, 28, therefore the Apostle Paul, with his final rebuke to these Jewish leaders who are rejecting Jesus Christ as the kingdom of God, therefore let it be known to you that this salvation, so what else is the kingdom of God? It is the Lord Jesus Christ and it is the salvation of God. That's how you answer what is the kingdom of God. It's Jesus who brings us salvation. Now, since we already heard uh, back up in the verse 23, trying to convince them about bo Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets, um, I, I thought I would just g simply give you an example of Paul preaching Jesus from the prophets. In Matthew chapter 12, Jesus was speaking to the Pharisees and they asked him for a sign. And he said, you perverted, adulterous generation. You're only going to get one sign. In other words, Jesus was going to leave the blindness upon them. You'll get a sign. Just as Jonah was three days in the belly of the whale, says Jesus, so also will the Son of Man be in the center of the earth for three days. That's your sign. Tick a lock. And they didn't get it. And Jesus shut his mouth. Guess what Jonah chapter 2, the prophet Jonah, Jonah chapter 2 verse 9 says, you know what it says? Don't go there yet. Listen. Remember why Jonah was so upset? Do you remember why he was so angry with God? All right, fine. Get all this vomit, whale vomit. All right, you Ninevites, repent, or God's going to judge you. There, I told him. Gosh, I can't stand these Ninevites. They don't deserve this, and they're all repenting. Oh, I told you. That's just like you, to be merciful, slow to anger, turning from wrath. It's the whole purpose, why didn't he want to be here? Chapter 2, verse 9. For salvation is of the Lord. <laughs> Which Jonah was celebrating after he got vomited out by the whale, praising God, salvation is of the Lord. But Jonah really doesn't believe salvation is of the Lord for everyone, just for those who can build the highest treehouse and keep others out. And that's all Jonah was doing. Do you believe salvation is of the Lord? 
Is there someone in your mind right now? You dread the day if God ever opened their eyes to see their need of Christ. You don't want to see that person saved. They don't deserve it. And that's exactly how the Jewish leaders were looking at this gospel because they despised the very fact that God would include Gentiles, non-Jews. They really did believe that they had built their treehouse high enough where no one dirty can get up here, no one small, someone, no one little, no one like us can be up here but us, us good people. What is the kingdom of God? It is the Lord Jesus Christ, and his salvation belongs to the Lord. Hands off. It belongs to the Lord. He will dispense it as he pleases to whomever he chooses. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Well, how do we proclaim it? When we, when we look at this text, we see several uh, helpful verbs on how Paul is going to instruct us, how Luke instructs us, what Paul is doing here. Um, if you go back uh, to where he was speaking before they uh, disbanded and, and left the room, we can just pick it back up with verse 18. When they had examined me, they wished to set me at liberty, and Paul is rehearsing the whole ordeal back down in Jerusalem, and he explains and explains and explains. And then when they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in greater numbers from morning till evening, and here we go. So how do we proclaim it? Well, expounded. Expounded. It means, it means to explain things in a, in a logical way. It means to lay it out. This, this is a beautiful word that just simply means where we get a word expository preaching from. But it means to explain and, and lay it out there plain and simple so that everyone can understand. Speak in their language if you need to, which Paul did. Use their language, which Paul did at times. Quoting their own poets. Expounding and explaining. So you, that's how you proclaim it. What else does he do? We see another verb here. From morning till evening, he expounded to them, testifying. Uh, the Greek word here is where we get our word martyr. Yeah. Which means to give a witness. So we think what Paul was doing here was doing what, he, what we've already read on several occasions when Paul was rehearsing that Damascus Road experience. The point is this. In proclaiming the kingdom of God, we lay it out there in a logical way from God's word. But we all might, all will, almost will at times, it will be appropriate to testify. Meaning, tell me how you got saved. And that's what Paul did. He told them what happened. Do you have a testimony? Can you give a witness how God has changed your life? What has he done for you? It doesn't mean that that's the gospel. It does mean that there's real stuff going on in my life. And, and I can't explain it other than the fact that Jesus met me on the road to Damascus and confronted me with my sin. And I turned to Christ as Lord and Savior. And I've been on a different road since then. Do you have that kind of testimony about you? And if you said it, would there be enough evidence to prove it? Testifying. We get another word here. And trying to convince. It means to persuade. And, I, and I'm, we're almost sure that this, this word also includes persuade with dialogue. In other words, there was an opportunity to say, wait a minute, Paul. And there was, there was a give and take back and forth. Objections raised. And so we need to be ready to... <clears throat> Have an answer and to listen to people, hear their objections, talk to them, reason with them. Don't just say the gospel and then give your testimony and then say, oh, no, no, no questions asked, please. No, you need to be able to interact with people. We see something else here all the way down at the very bottom. Verse uh, 30, he lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed and now we know that Jews and Gentiles are coming in and out of his home, Grand Central Station, maybe so to speak, hopefully, and he's welcoming them. So your attitude, 
Are you, do, you have, do you have a hospitable attitude or do you have an attitude that presents the gospel that just shuts people down and shuts people out? Are your arms like this? Is that your attitude? I want to share the gospel. I'm so glad to see you. Welcome. A welcoming heart and attitude. Do you see God standing over the portals of heaven like this? Or do you see him like this? Yes. Come. Come all you who labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Open arms. Open arms. Can you Jesus? Can you see Jesus? Shimming down the big oak tree. Can you see? Now I'll come down to you. I'll come down to you. And finally, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness. So I want to say boldness, a, a, a conviction, but without arrogance. There must be humility so that if Donald Trump ever tweets you and says you're nasty, say something truthful, say, say, say something cutting, something edgy, quote First Kings and say, I'll meet you on the mount. We'll see whose God is real. But then say something humbling. Not arrogant. You're right, Mr. Trump, running for president of the United States. I am a nasty man. And I need the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. You can be courageous and bold without being arrogant. And the reason why is because what we're standing on is not our own man-made kingdom, but we're standing on a kingdom whose foundation is the Lord, aren't we? And now I can be courageous. I can be bold. Because it's Jesus Christ that I'm talking about and representing. And I think that goes a long way in helping us understand how to proclaim the kingdom of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And why does this matter? And here we are. Why does this matter? And this is the way I want to end. Turn to chapter 1. We're going to start all over. Three more years to go. I'm just kidding. Acts chapter 1. Verse 1. Follow. Why does this matter? Why does this matter? Here we go. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. To them he presented himself alive after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom? See, Luke has bookended his front and back, his sequel to his gospel. Is it time to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus did not give a negative, but he did answer it like this. It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority. Stop right there. Why does this matter? All this matter, this kingdom stuff. Either you're in God's kingdom or you're in your own. You might be thinking and feeling that... Um, as all boys do when they build their little forts um, and keep out all those girls and then keep out all the smaller boys. You might think that your kingdom, your man-made kingdom, since it's just you know, running along smoothly and finely, uh, uh, fi well and with your family or work or your money or whatever it is, and you think that you're getting by. 
But that's only because the Father has fixed by his own authority the times and seasons by which men's kingdoms actually appear, how long they last, and when they go down. It's only because God has decided that you get to run your little kingdom, your little show for a little while. And then, in the meantime, while God is allowing the kingdoms of man to flourish under his authority, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who is taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Here's why this matters because Jesus is returning to establish on earth what he began in the hearts of those who believed on him out of every tribe, tongue, people, nation, including the Ninevites, including the little girls who weren't allowed, and including the little boys who can't climb high enough. Jesus is coming back, and there's only going to be one kingdom that's going to be standing in that day, and it's the kingdom of God. And every other kingdom is going to go boom! Every one of them. This is why this matters. All your man-made rules and your way of doing life and your initiation rights into your little private kingdom, boom. Your views of how the world ought to work with regard to sex, money, and power, and politics, and religion, and art, and industry, and commerce, boom. It's over. Or, shall we say, it's only begun. It's only begun. The only kingdom that will stand on the day of Christ's return is the kingdom of God. The one that Jesus rules and reigns over right now. Which one are you in? Which kingdom are you in? Which one will you live for? Which one will you proclaim with your life? In word and deed, as God gives you your spiritual gifts and uses you with welcoming arms and attitude toward a world that is building its own kingdom, but it will come to an end. Let's bow. Our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for the way Luke is wrapping up, the way you guided him to wrap up this incredibly long treatise to a very uh, important official in those days. I hope he came to old Theophilus. I hope he came to know the Lord. One day we'll find out the impact of, of Luke's writings upon this one particular man. And we'll also find out what you did with these words uh, throughout the world, Lord, out of every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. And to the degree, Lord, that we show the world that we are under the rule and reign of Jesus Christ by what comes out of our mouth and the way we, that we live our lives, then we are showing the world which is the true kingdom, which one will last and outlast all the man-made kingdoms of the earth. And we thank you for that, Lord. Give us mercy and grace to live for you under the rule and reign of Jesus Christ, the true King of kings and Lord of lords. May you get a lot of glory. May we get a lot of courage and joy and living for you until the day that you return. In Jesus' name we pray.